to give the floor to Mr. Butikofa, who is a great friend of the INJ committee. And he heads the uh, EU-China delegation, which includes Taiwan. Mr. Butikofa, you have uh, the floor for introductory remarks. Thank you very much, uh, my dear friend uh, Raphael Glücksmann, chair of the uh, committee. Uh, I can fully understand that you have been accustomed to having gender balanced speakers lists. So uh, I, I ask for forgiveness that I unbalanced that a little bit, but only for a uh, very few minutes. I want, uh, first of all, to take the opportunity of congratulating Audrey Tang uh, to the 111th National Day that uh, you celebrated in Taiwan yesterday and that we helped celebrating both Rafael and I um, in uh, Brussels yesterday and uh, I'm very happy to be able to uh, share in um, this dialogue with you because we all know how much you have been a bridge builder between Taiwan and uh, the European Union and some of its member states. And I also want to sign on to everything that Rafael Glicksmann said. And because we cherish uh, the service that you do and the development of Taiwan's democracy so much, we also want to invest from our own side into strengthening the relationship. So this committee was the first committee from the European Parliament to ever officially visit Taiwan. In December, the uh, Trade Committee will do the same, and probably in July, the Foreign Relations Committee will follow suit. So we're um, intensifying this exchange, and I hope uh, that from this dialogue that we're having with you now, we will also be able to learn from your experience because you have been exposed to Chinese aggression in different forms and shapes and dimensions. Um, and I, I'm sure we can learn from your experience in order to defend our own values that we share with you better against these authoritarian attempts. So thanks for making the time, and I'm looking forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Reinhardt. It was just that I was in such a hurry to listen to Audrey Tang, and uh, I fully concur with what you have just said. It's uh, very important that this parliament is actually stepping up relations with Taipei, and it's, it's a sign that uh, this House is really committed to the defense of democracy and freedom. And it's also very opportunistic, as we will see in this session, because we have a lot to learn from the Taiwanese experience. So now is the time to give you the floor, dear Audrey Tang. Uh, welcome in the European Parliament. We are listening to you. Um, good local time, everyone. And we we can hear you, but we cannot see you. Can you turn on? Yes. Uh, let me switch on the camera again. Um, just a second. Is this better? It's perfect, and we love your T-shirt. Oh yeah, it's a Ukrainian gift. So um, good local time, everyone. Uh, my name is Audrey Tang, and I'm Taiwan's Minister of Digital Affairs. It is a genuine pleasure to once again share ideas and thoughts uh, with the enlightened and innovative minds comprising the Special Committee uh, for Interference in All Democratic Processes in the EU, including disinformation. Um, it seems like only yesterday that I was sitting across from President Rafael Grigsman, uh, Coordinator Markita Grigorova, and other uh, ING members in Taipei uh, during the committee's historic visit to Taiwan. 
Our discussion uh, in November 2021 were highly productive and rewarding. I remember we went back and forth on a wide array of topics linked to our collective efforts to defend democracy. Uh, one of the most memorable and a personal favorite being the root causes of disinformation and best ways for our free and open societies to stand together in disarming its caustic effects. I remain impressed by the intellectual depth of our dialogue that day and am excited to take this opportunity to elaborate on Taiwan's internationally celebrated and recognized digital model of not just infodemic management, uh, but pandemic management in Taiwan. The two models are uh, very closely intertwined. Now, it is an inconvenient truth that COVID-19 brought great pressure to bear on our democracies. Many traditional institutions began to fissure and even fracture, and there were signs of democratic backsliding back then uh, as autocracies embarked upon high profile paths of human right violations uh, in the so-called name of public health and the greater good. Uh, in fact, still to this day, uh, the PRC, the People's Republic of China, uh, remains committed, uh, it seems, to this course of action as demonstrated by the trials and tribulations of those under an inflexible coronavirus policy hallmarked by ongoing lockdowns. Now, I'm pleased to say that in Taiwan, we're now paving the way for the post-pandemic new life, as you are, uh, by easing quarantine requirements, restoring visa-free entry to our ally and partner countries, and admitting more and more tourists. Uh, and our confidence lies in the fact that our democracy is young, vibrant, and developed alongside the internet. Between the lifting of the martial law in 1987 and the first direct presidential election in 1996, we saw the popularization of personal computers of the World Web in the span of just 10 years. So for us, democracy is like a technology, a social technology that can be enriched through the joint efforts of all. Now, our new ministry, the Ministry of Digital Affairs, MODA, is a guardian of our government's non-negotiable position that broadband is a human right. Through digital infrastructure and digital competence in education, we not only reduce the cost of civic technologies to improve, uh, we also ensure a completely open and uncensored environment with free speech. And this is one of the keys to letting a digital democracy flourish. Given that uh, 23.5 million people of Taiwan use the internet as a space for public discussion for democracy, we combat the pandemic with no lockdowns, not even a single day, and the infodemic, the disinformation crisis, with no takedowns from the administration. For instance, in late 2019, when news of the pandemic surfaced, uh, Taiwan's PTT bulletin board system, uh, think Reddit in the US, allowed uh, a registered user to post the warnings of a SARS-like disease uh, by the PRC's heroic Dr. Li Wenliang. And the government's, uh, Taiwan's rapid response to the late medical's early warning saved lives and heightened confidence and trust in our health agencies and our officials. So in my mind, there is no question that journalism, that is to say, finding out the facts, checking the sources and so on, um, of course, practiced by traditional journalists and newsrooms, that's very important, but also by everyone contributing to PTT and similar um, public spaces in the digital realm that allow us to surface not just the early signs of disinformation, but also early signs of genuine warnings, uh, like in Dr. Li Wenliang's case. Now, um, this uh, public space in the digital realm also enabled digital democracy to surface effective solutions to global challenges. I'll just use one example, the SMS-based contact tracing system in Taiwan called 1922. To eliminate community transmission, uh, we know contact tracing must be done rapidly uh, before people got uh, well vaccinated. Inaccurate information puts us in the dilemma of having to choose between protecting privacy on one hand and managing the pandemic on the other. But rolling out a mandatory governmental application where all data is concentrated to the state in Taiwan's environment would only backfire. Uh, 
So instead of centralizing uh, any personal data like contact tracing or yielding control to multinational corporations, uh, we found that there's social sector solutions with civic technologists. Uh, for example, the G0V, uh, the Gov0 community invented a mechanism of contact tracing based on text messages that do not violate people's privacy. We work across sectors with the design by the human rights activists and the civic technologists locally uh, so that telecom carriers can deploy that within just a week. By scanning the QR code with just 15 digits of random code with the built-in camera, no app download required, people kept track of their um, visits in a way that doesn't re-identify themselves to the venues. The venues never know anything, including their phone number. And this enable contact tracers only when necessary to confirm the footprints of the infected and their contacts and um, you know, notify them without revealing any private information to venue owners. So such collaboration cannot occur without strong trust between the sectors. Of course, we need to bridge the digital divide. So we never said that's mandatory for the seniors, for the people with seeing difficulties. Uh, they can still carry out the original way of contact tracing, like uh, handwriting and seal stamping and so on. But when contact tracers apply for information about certain phone numbers, they must submit requests through a shared platform that keeps this reciprocal transparency. So any phone number holder can then reverse audit which contact tracer from which municipality made the request, why and when. And all records uh, are deleted if there's no local outbreak after 28 days. And that's what enabled us to shorten the contact tracing window uh, from more than 24 hours to around 24 minutes uh, that help us to overcome the alpha, delta and the first Omicron wave until we get well vaccinated. And because the civic tech originated from the community, fiercely defending personal data and privacy, new challenges were responded to with timely improvements. For example, um, in a very early on in the 1922, um, it was discovered by a judge assessing a police search warrant that there was a police investigating a crime trying to access the mapping table between the random codes and the venues. Fortunately, the multi-party design prevented the police from accessing uh, what those code actually means. So not only the judge denied the warrant, uh, the judge publicly questioned on the newspaper the legality of wiretapping tax sending to 1922, even for serious crimes. So following uh, discussions, we very quickly uh, work with the Ministry of Justice to conclude that 1922 does not constitute communication under the Communi um, Communication Security and Surveillance Act and should not be repurposed for whatever reason for law enforcement. Now, this decision, again made publicly, preserved the original civic intent intact. So when developing digital policies, uh, cybersecurity, personal data protection. Uh, it's not just the government's role or the personal data authority's role uh, to pay attention. Of course, that's important. But aside from that, we also open channels for the public, for the social sector, uh, for inquiries about their own data and also devising new privacy enhancing technologies uh, to enable more like zero knowledge proofs and so on, homomorphic encryptions, federated learning and so on. Those latest algorithms um, can be uh, put into use in times like the pandemic. So data collected with the citizen's purpose in mind, with citizen empowerment at its heart. Now, this really is a core philosophy of our digital development. The data can only be appropriately used if it's appropriately sourced. And through collecting with this simple and secure methods while using data with strict adherence to the principle of account accountability, we demonstrated that the meaning of efficient and popular digital innovations and achieve a milestone in digital transformation. Now, rule by the people is the original intent of democracy. Uh, what you have heard about the 1922 SMS and so on is exactly the same model. In fact, the same community, G0V, uh, that popularized the use of the COFAX platform that allow people to contact trace uh, viral disinformation together by reporting, like reporting spam mail and junk mail. They work with uh, private sector actors like Trend Micro, our antivirus company, uh, or Google Luke, uh, which does the Who's Call isolated call blocking software and so on. There's this whole ecosystem system that across the sector we work together in the face of common threats. 
such as information manipulation and COVID-19. So I think both initiatives involved governments on all levels and businesses working hand in hand. So this is what we call a people-public-private partnership, where the social sector sets the norm, the public sector amplifies it, and the private sector implements it at scale. I envision this PPPP model as one of the ministry modas, a uh, key platform for international collaboration and tie-ups between Taiwan and all democracies as we set about answering the UN Secretary General's call for a coalition of the world to solve global challenges. So the people-public-private partnership strengthens democracy and is a way that I believe Taiwan can help. So to conclude, as we have shown in Taiwan, democracy is not just we working for the people, but with the people. Trusting citizens to participate in policymaking forms shared goals, develop innovative tools and solutions, and contributes to the shared goals, the planet also. So this is the cornerstone philosophy of the MODA's drive to free the future. So thank you for listening, and uh, I welcome all questions. Thank you, Minister. Uh, maintenant, je vais donner la parole uh, aux membres qui souhaitent. Thank you. I'll now give the floor to any members who would like to ask questions, beginning with Ms. Wiesler Lima for the EPP. Madame Wiesler Lima. Sir Wiesler Lima. Est ouvert. Est que voilà. Ça va, ça va mieux. Parfait. <rire> J'avais cliqué un peu trop, trop tôt sur le, sur le bouton. Euh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Euh, je voudrais d'abord, tout d'abord, remercier Audrey Pang et. The interpreters are taking industrial action and will not interpret participants uh, connecting remotely. This is due to the potential effects on our health of substandard sound and the failure to adopt working conditions for remote participation. À mettre en, en place. Um, but I think I'm, I'm not um, translated, so perhaps it's better I continue in... Uh, yeah, in can you speak in English, yes. because uh, there is no translation if you are not in the room. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't uh, paying attention. So um, my thanks again to Audrey Tang, and uh, I also wanted to notice that uh, I also very much appreciate, like our president, the T-shirt you, you had on. We are sincerely admirative of what you, you have achieved, um, and particularly on, on this protection of the, the personal data of, of, of the people. I had um, a, a broader question. Um, I, I really um, am um, asking this question to myself, how you are able to combat the Chinese narrative. Uh, we, in, in our um, committee, we, we talk about the foreign interference, and you have this uh, interference of, of China. And I'm, I'm, I'm the question is, um, in the light of all the, the commercial exchanges you have with China and, and the exchanges the other sort of exchanges that also bring with it, and the influence it has, how do you manage to combat a, a interference that is nocive for, for Taiwan? How do we do it? And uh, how much energy does it take? How, how, how broad is it? So I will stop here, and thank you very much again. Thank you. Now, Madame Loiseau, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and thank you really very much, Minister, for uh, exchanging views with us today. I myself would also like to express my deep admiration for the way uh, you counter attacks against democracy with the tools of democracy. But not only because you wear uh, a beautiful T-shirt, I, I wanted to ask you, what are the lessons learned for Taiwan from the war in Ukraine? I'd like to know, um, is the mobilization of Ukraine and social media uh, and in strategic communication an inspiration for Taiwan? And do you have exchanges of best practices? Um, 
or uh, have you learned about potential new sorts of threats and how do you intend to address them? Um, I would also like to know uh, whether you consider that, in a sense, uh, and unwillingly, of course, Ukraine is turning attention away from Taiwan, at least in Western societies. Um, I would be much interested in knowing how do you reach out to the Chinese diaspora abroad, to a Chinese audience uh, in PRC, if you're trying to do it, and how do you communicate with what we now call, call the Global South, which um, showed in the war uh, in Ukraine its reluctance to take side and its defiance towards the defense of democratic values. And finally, um, I would like to know how do you deal with political divides within Taiwan and the constant risk of fracture of the society that might be exploited by PRC. Thank you very much. Merci. Maintenant, la parole est à Monsieur Ostrevicius. Mr. Ostrevicius has the floor. Thank you, Raphael, and thank you, colleagues, for organizing this uh, important and interesting uh, exchange with Minister uh, Tang. Minister, I, I do recall our meeting in Taiwan, and thank you very much for that time we had. We had very fruitful and uh, enlightening exchange and uh, your experience in uh, digitalization of the uh, economy and society in Taiwan is really inspiring. It's something, I mean, we have to follow and learn and work and cooperate together to bring uh, more uh, global results of this kind. And uh, your t-shirts um, just illustrate that uh, you are rightly tuned and um, your political senses are absolutely right in this, in this regard. Minister, I have two questions to you. With the recent um, military tensions uh, uh, from um, the uh, People's Republic of China uh, on the Straits uh, of Taiwan. I mean, what kind of the uh, cyber attacks, I mean, uh, have been employed from the China side in order to make an uh, impact on your economy as well, data processing? Uh, was anything new in this regard? I mean, did the uh, Chinese side uh, use some new technologies and techniques uh, as never before? But that is very interesting because uh, we know that uh, cyber attacks become uh, more and more powerful and employ new uh, tools uh, um, every time. And my second uh, <clears throat> question is about the security of uh, underwater data cables. Uh, to what extent uh, you consider it as a, a national security issue because cables still connect us? I mean, we don't have probably more reliable uh, data uh, um, processing uh, uh, um, technology. And uh, do you regard that uh, Taiwan data, um, uh, data cables uh, connecting uh, globally are safe enough uh, in order to secure your uh, digital economy and society? Thank you, Minister. Thank you. La parole est à Monsieur Fest. Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you for being here with us today. And uh, my uh, question is a very brief one. Do you have already experienced so-called deep fakes in, uh, in Taiwan? And um, yeah, do you see any uh, chance to fight them? Uh, and what are you going to do about this? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kistos. You have the floor. Thank you, President. Um, I have a question concerning um, uh, the digital economy. Uh, I was in Taiwan in November as well, and I was impressed by the fact that uh, the Taiwanese economy uh, is very advanced in digital terms, in uh, world champions in the production of microchips, and, of course, um, there is an economic, social, and political aspect 
uh, of all this uh, impressive progress. Uh, the question that I have uh, has to do with uh, the digital embargo applied uh, by the United States against uh, mainland China. Uh, there are certain concrete measures, um, and I wonder uh, to what extent this embargo has affected Taiwanese success. Uh, because uh, from what I remember, you had uh, an immense commercial uh, surplus in your relations with mainland China. Uh, could you please uh, inform us? Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Mr. Butikofer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, you described the success of your quadruple P alliance in uh, repelling uh, the pandemic. I would uh, invite you to describe how the same kind of alliance, PPPP, um, alliance uh, could be used in repelling uh, political attacks uh, from uh, ill-minded neighbors, for instance. Um, obviously, there has to be, I would assume, an all-of-society approach, and the principle that you have explained represents that kind of thinking. Uh, maybe, ironically, we could call it a united front effort <laughs> in countering that one united front that we're uh, confronted with. What role do political parties play in, in uh, Taiwan in that regard, and think tanks and citizens associations, NGOs? Uh, can you give us examples there? And also my second question, and it's been alluded to before by a colleague, we increasingly in the, in the uh, in in being confronted with uh, Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine, we realize that there is um, public opinion front also in the global south, where uh, the Russians and um, the PRC peddle lies about. Uh, the reality in Ukraine and uh, try to undermine those that defend democracy and territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. So uh, how do you deal with that, let me call it, southern front? Thank you. And uh, I will have also, before giving you back the floor, dear minister, uh, two quick questions. F Part of the mandate of this committee is to prepare uh, European elections of 2024 and to make sure that uh, we can counter foreign interference in these elections. So can you explain to, to us um, how you tackle the disinformation and, and, and campaign of uh, uh, disinformation during election period uh, in Taipei? And, and my, my second, second, the second question will be a build-up on Reinhardt's question. question. Uh, I mean, did you have time to follow a bit the propaganda efforts from Russia and the disinformation campaign in Global South, but also in general in Europe? Uh, I mean, how do you, what kind of advice would you have for us uh, in order to counter uh, these efforts coming from the Russian government? I mean, obviously, uh, you have a lot to do with uh, the, Chinese the Chinese Communist Party, Party. but in a way what you are doing against the Chinese Communist Party's interference can also be of a huge interest for us in countering in this very important moment of history uh, Russian efforts in Europe and in the Global South. So thank you so much, Minister. You have the floor. Thank you for the great questions. Uh, in the interest of time, I will try to... We cannot hear you. We can no? see you this time, but not hear you. Okay, um, in the interest of time, uh, I oh. hope you can hear me now. No? Can you hear me now? Good. Okay. So in the interest of time, uh, I will um, 
answer uh, two or more questions with one answer uh, because I'm aware of uh, time that we have maybe uh, 25 minutes. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll use a few concrete examples to explain the PPPP uh, model, especially leading up to elections uh, to strengthen democracy despite, of course, partisan uh, differences. Um, two examples. One is that leading up uh, to the presidential election in 2020, um, the civil society people uh, noted that in the 2018 uh, mayoral election, uh, although our domestic uh, sunshine laws prohibited uh, foreign payment uh, to the local campaigns and uh, local campaign donors, uh, they must have their names uh, disclosed and the amount disclosed uh, in terms of open data, uh, still, um, the, the, the control yuan, uh, the place that collects those data in 2018 for the first time, published these as open data after years of requests uh, from GovZero and other civil society communities. Now, looking at the, the open data for the first time, people noted that the social media uh, companies, especially, well, I'll just say Facebook, uh, advertisements uh, were not listed uh, as campaign donation or expenditure, uh, but there were a lot of political and social advertisement targeted uh, to vote uh, during the time leading to 2018. And so, uh, in effect, there was a loophole against uh, this whole fact-checking process. Uh, simply someone outside of Taiwan, outside of our jurisdiction, uh, just buy some targeted advertisement and bypass the entire system that I just uh, mentioned. Uh, but uh, instead of passing a, a law to demand uh, Facebook to comply, uh, the people, the same people uh, who um, just um, you know, demonstrated uh, and made the control you and say, okay, we'll just open data, everything. Uh, simply talk to Facebook saying that you may face uh, social sanctions if you do not hold yourself uh, to the same standard uh, as the, you know, the control yuan, right? The, the people uh, publishing the expenditure. And so Facebook voluntarily uh, said, okay, let's make Taiwan one of the first, if not the first uh, jurisdiction to do the civic integrity and honest advertisement placement and so on. So that uh, the normal fact checking process Process, uh, can continue to function without being unduly influenced by advertisement money. So leading up to 2020, uh, we see uh, disinformation much more clearly uh, before they spread uh, because they could not be augmented uh, by sponsorship by advertisement. So uh, there was a uh, trending disinformation in Taiwan uh, leading to 2020, uh, and I quote, uh, the young people in Hong Kong are being paid uh, 200,000 to murder police, end of quote. Uh, of course, that's not true, uh, And but it used um, true-looking photos, not really defake. It's an actual Reuters photo, uh, except the Reuters caption uh, initially just said uh, there are young people in Hong Kong protesting. It says nothing about being paid and so on. Uh, so the, the narrative, uh, the alternate caption around these um, is not pro any particular party. It's actually just anti-democracy. Uh, the message, uh, the refrain is always the same. Uh, democracy always lead to chaos on the street. Democracy cannot run an election properly. Uh, democracy only leads to people hating each other, so on and so forth. So I wouldn't say it's uh, benefiting any particular party, uh, but rather it's trying to uh, decimate people's trust uh, in the democratic process. Uh, but instead of taking anything down, uh, the fact checkers in the international fact checking network uh, in Taiwan uh, very quickly found out uh, because they know that this was the trending one with the highest uh, basic reproduction number as surfaced by people voluntarily uh, diagnosing it. Right, so uh, they traced this to the Weibo account uh, of Zhongyang Zhengfa Wei Chang'an Jian, the Central Political Law Unit. Uh, in Beijing. Uh, and so um, ever after the participating social media, including Facebook, uh, you can still see that photo with alternate caption. Uh, but once you try to share it or even before you click into it, uh, there's this this notice, very clear notice saying, uh, well, this is essentially sponsored by the CCP. Click here to, to learn more. Uh, so in doing this PPPP, it's very important that the state is not the fact checker, uh, but we need to work with the fact checkers, with the civil society people, even the middle schoolers uh, who do as they're part of uh, digital competence learning, fact check our three presidential candidates as they are having the uh, platform and debate and the student that corrects one of the candidates errors and typos uh, may have their names uh, appear in uh, live streams and so on. So it takes all hands on deck 
uh, to do this journalism fact checking work. Uh, but when sufficiently amount of people do that together, it's just like uh, building good um, counter pandemic habits. It lowers the basic transmission number of uh, the disinformation uh, of the toxic uh, variant. So uh, I hope that more closely uh, illustrated the roles that each parties play uh, in this common uh, leading up to the election uh, fight. Uh, even on the day of election, there was a trendy disinformation that, uh, and I quote, uh, the CIA printed invisible inks. So no matter which person you choose, always Dr. Tsai Ing-wen uh, gets this invisible seal and so on, end of quote. So, uh, uh, and but again, this is dispelled uh, not by taking down anything, uh, but by the YouTubers, the the people who film the entire counting process uh, from the major parties. So each major party's people, they may or may not trust the other major parties YouTubers, but they do trust their celebrity YouTubers. Uh, and so when uh, the uh, counting uh, station at question, uh, there's multiple different angles. Uh, people prove uh, that it's actually not invisible ink going on uh, and the uh, message was doctored and so on. Uh, it spread through the various different party channels, uh, even the opposition party, the multiple opposition parties. And so in this, uh, encountering this information, and deepening ties to international democratic countries. I don't think there is a uh, difference in direction uh, in the major four parties in our parliament. Uh, so that, uh, I hope, illustrated uh, the point about this all of society approach. Now, if I may, uh, I will uh, go to uh, my, my t-shirt. Um, we, we have uh, learned a lot uh, from the Ukrainian experience. Uh, the first thing we learned is that even when the marine cables, the undersea cables in Taiwan uh, are under attack, if they suffer failure, uh, non-geostationary satellites can provide uh, the kind of video resolution as we are having now. Uh, it is actually a useful uh, substitute. And it is also a necessary one because without which, uh, if you only have a few lines of words or some uh, photos and so on, it's not as viral <laughs> as this information. There's going to be a, a need uh, to receive what's actually going on in the ground. And if we do not provide it, in a kind of live stream uh, way, then uh, doctored uh, information uh, or just deep fakes uh, will probably take its place. Uh, so uh, we have invested uh, quite heavily uh, into building uh, 700 or more uh, local uh, non geostationary satellite um, uh, disks uh, to, to communicate uh, and also oversee points, three oversee points as well. Uh, and we will practice so that um, even during like normal times, uh, because we have earthquakes and typhoon all the time, uh, it will also be easy for us to switch uh, between different modalities. So as to, of course, we will still safeguard uh, our um, marine cable, sea cable connections, uh, but having multiple alternatives in non-geostationary uh, bandwidth, I think that is very important. Um, and the new uh, cyber attacks, uh, I, I think uh, during uh, the US uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit and immediately after, we suffered um, like more than 23 times uh, compared to the previous peak uh, distributed denial of service or DDoS. Uh, now, now DDoS is not by itself technically very sophisticated, uh, but it's part of a hybrid approach where for example, the websites of the presidential office or the Ministry of National Defense gets interrupted by DDoS for just a while, right? Uh, but during those, say, half an hour or an hour, uh, a message goes out and say uh, that um, the disinformation would say uh, that this, this MND or the presidential office has been taken over uh, by the cyber attacks, by the, the um, black hats. Uh, but of course, that's that's not true. It's just like um, dialing into a phone line or uh, faxing into a fax machine repeatedly uh, doesn't mean you have taken over the machine, uh, but it's not uh, it, it's not the same, right? So we clarified uh, very quickly that not only it's not the same, uh, but we also engaged uh, people in other jurisdictions uh, that want to participate in the collaborative defense. Uh, whether they're from this, uh, what we call any cast uh, network of uh, content delivery networks, 
or through interplanetary file system or IPFS, the kind of Web3 backbone where people can dedicate their machines uh, and storage to help us to send our websites out. So on the hour of the so-called drill uh, of the PRC, um, the, the MODAS uh, website went online and still today you can exit it over both um, the web and also the Web3 uh, IPFS. Uh, and so we successfully did a almost like humor over rumor uh, playbook uh, to turn the conversation into something interesting, uh, something exciting. Uh, and so that people understand like a vaccine of the mind uh, that uh, blocking access to a website is not the same as taking over the website and so on. So we have put more um, emphasis on the availability uh, in the confidentiality, integrity, and availability access when it comes to the cybersecurity issues. Uh, I hope that answered the question uh, about the uh, marine uh, cables and the PRC cyber attacks. Uh, we have not encountered uh, significant attacks uh, in terms of deep fakes. Uh, part of the reason was that even before uh, this generation of defake uh, technology become mature, uh, we have been filming uh, inoculation <laughs> uh, films. Uh, the Board of Science and Technology uh, a few months ago um, filmed a young actor uh, deepfaking as me. Uh, and saying things about defects. Uh, and it went uh, reasonably popular. Uh, and we showed that how even just with a handheld uh, phone or a laptop, uh, nowadays uh, people can with very low cost uh, synthesize with one, uh, one another's image. And so before sharing anything in outrage or something like that, always check the sources and we uh, share how to check the sources. Now, uh, I think the, the window for deepfake to cause serious damage is that when people understand uh, that uh, Photoshop or copy and pasting uh, text is easy, but editing video seems hard. Uh, but once people understand now with advanced uh, machine learning models, uh, well, actually faking video is very easy. Uh, with the diffusion models, you don't even have to film anyone. You just type the script and the uh, machine films it uh, by itself, right? So once everybody knows that uh, we are now at this stage, uh, defects uh, are reduced in its effectiveness. Uh, so instead of taking anything down, again, we rely on more democracies in the digital competence and data competence uh, in both our basic education and in lifelong education. So I hope that also answers uh, how to resist the PRC narrative despite uh, the economic ties, because again, the, the narrative was always that democracy leads to chaos and so on is bad, because that's really the only way that they could uh, say that annexation is somehow good for the life for people in Taiwan. It's only if democracy leads to a, a bad life, right? But by deepening democracy and showing that democracy actually works and people enjoying more democracy, not just once every four or two years, uh, but rather day to day uh, petitions, uh, electronic petitions uh, that actually work uh, and uh, turns into actual policy. I mean, and participatory budgets and uh, hackathons, sandbox applications and so on. So it, it builds people's trust uh, in all levels of democracy. And that's, I think, how to counter uh, the narrative, because if you have encountered uh, a real space of deliberation of democratic conversation, either online or uh, face to face, uh, it enabled the citizen to consider uh, other people's perspective and therefore unlikely to be swayed uh, by this uh, message based on outrage and so on. So building the digital equivalent of the town halls, public parks, um, the university campus and so on, instead of, you know, just uh, getting everybody uh, and their town halls into the digital equivalent of a nightclub. Uh, meaning Facebook, uh, then uh, we, we can actually build spaces more like this one, uh, where people can carefully consider uh, each other's point. Now, I don't have anything against the entertainment sector. I think entertainment sector is, is great, but uh, we need to uh, very clearly delineate the spaces that actually are binding in terms of democratic effect vis-a-vis uh, -vis places uh, mostly for uh, adult uh, entertainment, right? So that's that's the thing. Uh, the other uh, question I hear uh, was about how to reach out uh, to the Global South and to the uh, PRC diaspora and things like that. I, I think uh, that the point I'm making here is that it's not necessarily a state to state or diplomatic uh, level. When I say that people engaging uh, Web3 
um, technologies can help in preserving the availability, integrity, and also through zero knowledge proofs confidentiality uh, of Taiwan's um, governmental websites and data and so on. It literally means that people in like if it's a Ethereum ecosystem that may be in Argentina, um, but maybe in any place in the world, right? They can contribute because they identify uh, with Taiwan's value of democratic resilience uh, as a company, as a local grassroots groups and things like that, uh, without necessarily their government uh, telling them uh, to do so. And in fact, uh, we are probably one of the, the most uh, well-known places where the uh, new ideas emerging from any place in the world, uh, including quadratic voting, quadratic funding, and so on, can be put into presidential level use. Um, so we uh, strive uh, to provide not just our basic education curriculum, uh, the digital competence curriculum to the general population in Taiwan, but also making sure that the open hardware, the open software uh, that leads to this kind of practicing data collection and data stewardship is generally available to the global south because we firmly believe that practicing democracy from a very young age uh, be before uh, people even go into the digital equivalent of entertainment sectors, uh, right? Uh, if our young people understand that uh, the digital space is also for uh, democracy, is also for data stewardship and uh, perhaps enhancing uh, ways to increase the welfare of the public, then it's unlikely for them to think about internet is necessarily just a place uh, for people to polarize or to uh, divide or to build outrage and other uh, more more mature, I guess, uh, emotions. So that's, uh, I think that that's my point uh, in uh, responding to a diaspora and the global south. Now, I I'm aware that there's only 10 minutes or so. Did I miss anything? No, you, you didn't miss anything, but if you want to add something, then okay. feel totally free because uh, we, we don't have you in our committee every day, so you, you can also uh, add something. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I think I will add uh, one thing. Um, when we build uh, the new curriculum uh, in Taiwan, uh, we really changed a lot from the traditional uh, examination or standardized answer or memory-based way that the stereotypical East Asian uh, way of education. And this is partly because uh, we understand that the sooner the young people uh, started to practice democracy, the sooner their voice counts, even before their vote counts, uh, the more likely that they will contribute uh, to the democratic process and less likely to be influenced by this information. And once they build such competencies, uh, usually they have a lot of uh, sway uh, in uh, convincing their grandparents, their parents, and so on, that there are certain techniques, if mastered and easy to master, that enable people to check the sources, contribute to the sources, flag the uh, ongoing disinformation, and so on, uh, just like um, for a while, wearing masks and washing hands uh, since early 2020, uh, when the young people built such pro-social uh, habits, it's easy to propagate uh, upwards. So, so my recommendation is really think of it as a long-term educational uh, approach. We need to build resilience in the mind, in the practice, in a way that makes those practices seem natural. Uh, and just like uh, I, I keep mentioning uh, the cybersecurity practices and so on, because that's the same for cybersecurity as well. Uh, if you want people to not uh, leak their passwords and so on, uh, then invent something uh, like the zero trust network uh, that doesn't need people to memorize uh, pass passwords in the first place, uh, that enable secure authentication uh, using the device and biometrics strictly on the device and not anywhere else, and so on, and, and making the sign-in uh, easier. Uh, than typing passwords, and then people can build better habits. But of course, existing habits die hard, uh, which is why, of course, the, the younger the generation, the more likely uh, that they will build a new habit and help to carve out ways, narratives uh, that will also convince uh, people who are more senior than they are, which is why we have reverse mentors, uh, people younger than 35, advising each and every of our cabinet members in the way to make uh, these good habits and spread them. Uh, I hope that uh, adds to the points uh, raised. 
Thank you, Minister, and we will keep this reverse mentors line for here. Uh, I'm not sure everybody will be very uh, at ease with this idea, but I think it's, it would be very useful for the old European democracies to have also this uh, uh, institutionalized uh, reverse mentors. Um, so thank you so much, Minister, and now I, I am giving the floor to uh, Lutz Gullner for the uh, External Action Service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very briefly, because um, as we discussed in the previous session, disinformation is not just about communications and narratives. Uh, we need to understand the entire ecosystem and also the infrastructure that is being used. Um, and I think uh, this has come out also very well from the, the minister's uh, points that we need to think broad in, first of all, what we detect, how we analyze, how we counter uh, all this. But it's important not to forget that this is not only about setting narratives, but also about suppression of voices, um, something that uh, is uh, not really in the focus of our debates. By way of intimidation, by technical means of uh, depriving people of their voices, of their critical voices also. And I think this is very, very important that we always keep this, uh, this in, in mind. I had the honor to share a panel with the Minister at the Global Media Forum in, in Bonn earlier this year, where we discussed exactly this, how these internal restrictions that more and more authoritarian regimes are using are actually in a way transposed and transported also to the outside, um, so interfe as interference tools. And that is, that is uh, I think, something that we need to keep in mind. We have a lot to learn from the Taiwanese approach, in particular this whole of society approach on elections, on many other things. Minister men mentioned kind of also these medium to long term issues like education. And I can only say that we are very, very happy with our cooperation also with the colleagues in, uh, in Taipei, also with the civil society, which is really um, a source of inspiration for, for many of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gulnar. Uh, and uh, again, a huge warm thank you uh, to Minister Tung. We are in this boat together, and even sometimes you are in the front of the boat and, and we stay a bit behind and lag behind, but um, it, it's very important uh, for us to have you here. It was very important, and we will keep cooperating with you. Uh, we are facing very difficult times, but. Uh, Taiwan is really for us a symbol of hope and a proof, a living proof, that actually democracies can defend themselves while becoming more and more democratic, and that uh, actually you are uh, showing us the way. So thank you so much for uh, having been with us today, and uh, I'm sure that's not the last time uh, we see each other, we speak to each other, and we walk together. If there isn't any other business, we can move on to the last item on the agenda. That is the date of our next meeting. But I'd like to thank Reinhardt for attending and for his ongoing work in connection with China and democracy and defending freedoms. So the date of our next meeting is Thursday, 13th October from 9 a.m. to 12.30. And I'd also like to thank the speakers, the members who attended and who discussed uh, the points themselves, that was democracy, uh, the interpreters who do an excellent job, the technical staff here in Brussels and the fantastic ING2 Secretariat. So thank you very much and have a nice afternoon.